Harigi, Pull Hard Lads. The Kerry Curragh, 1977. The Boyne Curragh, 1937. This valuable archive film shows the construction of one of the last surviving examples of the Irish River Curragh at Old Bridge on the River Boyne, 30 miles north of Dublin. Its framework is of hazel rods and it has a gunnel of woven sally twigs. A single ox hide covered the frame, which may have helped to dictate its shape. Such a curach ein sheche is mentioned in early Irish literature. There are similar coracles to be found on the rivers of South Wales today, but the netting of salmon in fresh water, which became illegal in Ireland in 1948, sounded the death knell of the Boyne curach. The shallow draft and manoeuvrability of this curragh enabled it to get right in under the weir and avoid the undertow. This sea curragh, which is found only in Donegal in the northwest of Ireland, is remarkably similar to the Boyne curragh and is the last traditional craft in Ireland to use the paddle. James McGonagall brought this curragh with him from Oe Island when he settled at Kincasla on the mainland three years ago. An old saying has it that a curragh is a man's load. This short curragh is unlikely to survive much longer. A larger rowing curragh, measuring up to 20 feet, also survives in North Donegal. James McGonagall kneels on a pad of heather or his coat to paddle. The small curragh is the ideal craft for hauling lobster pots, which have to be set as close as possible to the rocks. In the last century, it was made of hazel rods covered by ox hide, horse hide, or even seal skin, somewhat like the Boyne curragh. Now, however, the framework is of oak laths with a gunnel also of wood and a covering of tarred canvas. A bottle of holy water is always carried to ward off disaster. Here in Blacksod Bay, County Mayo, and further south off the coast of North Galway, the curragh has some distinctive features. This example is from Cleggan, County Galway. The prow and stern are not nearly so steep as in the Arran curragh. It is shallower and its profile is less extreme. Planks set close together replace the laths used elsewhere. Though still canvas covered, the locals claim this gives it more protection from the rocks. In North Mayo, the oar pivots between two thole pins. From Ackill all the way to Kerry, Curragh's have a double gunnel. 
Wood is scarce here on the Aran Islands, and any suitably shaped branch washed ashore is put to use. The block on the floor of the bow supported a mast carrying a small lug sail, which is now scarcely ever used. A sail was also used on the currachs of the Dingle Peninsula, County Kerry. The plank stern of Aran and Clare contrasts sharply with the Kerry design. These bladeless oars, pivoting on a single thole pin, have their only parallel outside Ireland in Portugal and Madeira. The Kerry Curragh, locally called Naevog, is considered the most elegant and best finished of all, with its gently curving bow and stern. The men of Dunin, County Kerry, show how an expert handles these long oars, keeping one hand slightly ahead of the other because of the overlapping grips. From the Coos beneath the shoulder of Mount Brandon, St. Brendan is reputed to have sailed the Atlantic in a hide-covered curragh in the 6th century. The craft of curragh making is still carried on in the village of Balenvurig nearby. One of the older men from whom Eddie Hutchinson learnt his craft boasted that practically every piece of wood in a Naevog is either curved or aslant. Strange to say, the Naevog was introduced to the Dingle Peninsula from County Clare only at the middle of the last century and never reached South Kerry. The four lengths of white deal for the bow gunnels are steamed and placed around a mould to give them the necessary curve. Their brown colour was produced by the tannin from the oak ribs also in the steamer. The bow ribs, which need to be sharply bent, are tied around a number of metal moulds. The Naevog had its heyday during the two world wars. In 1942, there were 60 Naevogs fishing out of the Kuas, and a night's catch might total 4,000 mackerel, and there was a ready market for them. Young Tom Hutchinson may yet be a champion oarsman like his father. At least he'll be able to build himself a Naevog. The lower gunnel is laid down first. The thwarts, called tachti in this Irish-speaking area, with a knee of aroko attached, are screwed onto it. This word tachta, like many other boating terms, was borrowed from the Vikings who settled in Ireland. This particular naevog is a small two-seater. The stanchions are positioned at regular intervals and hold the upper and lower gunnels together.
For a number of years now, even the longer Neavog has a narrower beam and lower gunnel than formerly, in order to make it more suitable for racing in local regattas. Jack Shea from next door is here to help in putting the Fonsi into position. Oh my God, in the absence of a keel, the double gunnel keeps the whole structure in shape. This may explain the inverted construction which is peculiar to Irish curraghs. The Kerry Navog is distinguished mainly by the way in which the laths shear upwards and converge at the stern. Eddie's wife Hannah makes her contribution by painting on the Kerry colours instead of the customary green and red lead. The canvas is loosely tacked in position to get the shape right. Mary, a helpful neighbour, sews it together. When in position, the canvas gets two coats of boiling tar. To carry out repairs, one simply fires the damaged surface so that the tar softens. A strip of canvas, or the tail of one's shirt in an emergency, is then stuck on, a simple case of burning one's boats. Noel Cummins, himself a Navog builder from Castle Gregory, pays an unexpected visit. This is our mighty teller, her car is the pound of butter fold. Talking of butter, St. Brendan is reported to have taken a quantity along with him to dress the hides he might need for repairs to his curragh. The Aran Islands, like the whole west coast of Ireland, 
have supported a dense population for the past 200 years, though the barren rock had little to offer these people. Here in Inishman, all roads lead to the sea. Isolation has ensured the survival of many elements of traditional life here, though an airstrip has recently been constructed. <laughs> On Inish Man, the Karach is far from being the pleasure boat it has become in Kerry. The life of this island community is still centered on it. Its capacity to withstand heavy seas and the ease with which it can be handled on the undeveloped landing places make it ideal for inshore fishing. The outboard motor is no stranger to the Karach. The long rising bow and the round keelless bottom of the Karach have their only parallel outside Ireland in the Scandinavian Prom. This may be a pure coincidence, but one should always remember the many Irish seafaring terms borrowed from the Vikings, including in all probability the very word bod, meaning boat. Today, the slipway is the focal point on the island. Two men can comfortably carry a karach. These karachs are stored upside down, resting on piles of stones in a karach pen, well out of the reach of the sea. Here comes the postman to collect and dispatch the island's mail. The fact that the Karach does not have a keel means that its bottom has practically no grip on the surface of the sea, and there is therefore little friction. This is a big advantage in stormy weather, when the Karach, being naturally very buoyant and riding high, can be spun easily into the path of oncoming waves. If the seas are really big, the oarsmen stop pulling just before reaching the crest of a wave. Last night's catch of salmon is on its way to the market. Most of the karaks are made on the island of Inishir and have a life of about eight years or more if well maintained. The Niveana is the island's lifeline to Galway on the mainland, ferrying as it does both passengers and merchandise. Lobsters in this box have to be kept immersed in salt water to ensure that they are still alive when they get a hot reception in Paris or London. The Nivena has to anchor some distance offshore as the sea is too shallow for her to stand in closer. This is where the Karak really comes into its own. 
Today it is calm, but it can be a tricky and difficult task getting passengers and cargo off the boat. In a heavy swell, there is always the danger of catching the gunnel or thole pin of the curragh under the rubbing strake, which surrounds the Niveana, and so capsizing. Except for smaller items, which the plane can now carry, everything else has to come by ship. The carrying capacity of the Curragh is enormous, and a load of two tons is not exceptional. On some of the islands off the Donegal coast, it was normal practice to place a beast on its back with its legs tied in a Curragh. The Curragh was then carried into the water. Here in Inishman and Inishir, the stock has to swim for it. Bottled gas has made a big difference to the comforts of island life. Only a small amount of turf is now shipped from the mainland, though coal is still burnt. Whatever the exact history of the Curragh, it seems that Curragh navigation, as practiced in the days of the original Niveana, who established his monastery in Ireland in the 6th century, suffered an eclipse possibly during the turmoil of the Viking invasions. There are indications that the Curragh continued in use in the medieval period. O'Sullivan Bear had hide-covered Curraghs measuring 26 feet, constructed to cross the Shannon during his famous retreat in 1602. The increasing dependence on the sea of the congested population of the west coast is likely to have provided the impetus for the development undergone by the Curragh in the last century. In 1853, the Aran Curragh was described as being only eight feet long, at the very time it was being introduced into Kerry from Clare in the aftermath of the Great Famine. It has served its purpose well.